Hi, welcome to Wake TV. I'm your host, Taylor Shaw. It's been a hot summer and we have a lot in store for you today. So stay tuned. Did you know Wake County offers free childbirthing classes? Let's learn more about this program for expecting parents. I'm Leah Holdren and I'm here with Darlene Singletary who is our maternal and child health section manager. And we are standing in one of our offerings of childbirth education classes. Darlene, can you tell us a little bit about what these classes are, what they offer to moms to be, parents to be, what can people expect? Yes, yeah, so our childbirth education classes are classes that we offer to the community free of charge. Uh, these are classes that can be hosted as a five week series meaning that they would come every Monday or Tuesday um, for five weeks from the time of 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. Or we do what we call a one-day class where the parents will come and they would come for about four hours straight um, and they would get like a condensed version of what that five-week series would be. Um, but the classes are very impactful, filled with information about how parents can be more aware about childbirth education, um, learning the anatomy behind it, but also to learning coping skills and different techniques on how to have a more natural labor, but even for those parents that are wanting to use medication, how to take the, the best choice of which medication may best serve them and their baby. That's great. And I know that your team, the Maternal and Child Health division as a whole, that entire section offers a lot of services to not only moms-to-be, parents-to-be, but newborns, moms right after they've given birth. How does all of these services, classes work together um, to help the the new ones in Wake yeah. County. So with maternal and child health, we really serve those birth to child to five, um, as well as those pregnant moms and those parents that are parents of those that are birth to five. Um, but the great thing about maternal and child health, we're very integrated in the way that our services work because everybody has a hand in each program, whether it be through referral or whether it be once they finish one program, they roll over to the to the next. Especially with our childbirth education classes, this is a support um, system that we have or support service that we have in our MCH programs that's offered to any parent that comes through any of our other programs through our clinics or anything just public health. Um, so we're very we're very connected in the sense of being integrated into those prenatal and child spaces so that parents can utilize our free services. That's great. Um, and these classes are very popular. Uh, you've had to expand and offer more classes. What are you hearing from the people who take part? Oh, that they love the classes. They wish that they were longer. Uh, they wish that they had a class to come to after having the baby. But we get a lot of moms that come and, and really show their expression of how grateful they were to have come through a childbirth education class and how impactful it was during their, their birthing journey and how they were take, able to take those things that they learned and apply it to their birth and to come back and say for themselves that they had a good birth outcome. And that for us is what we're looking for. We're wanting to ensure that parents have that confidence, that they have that awareness and that education to go out and advocate for themselves to have a good birth outcome. And them just being able to come back and share it with us is just like the icing on the cake. And so if someone is interested in signing up, are there restrictions? I know that you mentioned a lot of the referrals come from people who are already uh, using the services. How would one sign up and, and what? Um, how would they go about that? So there's not too many restrictions. The only thing that I would say would be language, but however, we do have language line systems that if a person that doesn't speak English or Spanish wants to participate in one of our classes, we can make it available to them. Um, but for anyone that is interested in our classes, all they would have to do is go to wake.gov, type in maternal and child health, and childbirth education classes should pop up and they can apply online, well, register online. Um, but like I said, it's a free service, so anyone that lives within Wake County is welcome to participate in any one of our classes that we offer. And how long, you, I know you mentioned you have a longer class, it's weekly, Mondays, Fridays, for how long? So we do, right now we have a Monday, 
Tuesday and Wednesday classes. We offer two um, English and one Spanish at the current moment. And then we also offer one day classes. So for the series, this would be that they would come every Monday or every Tuesday for five weeks straight from six to 8 p.m. Um, and then for our one, to one day classes, they would come on a Friday. Um, and this is offered once a month in both English and Spanish. Great. Well, thank you so much for talking to us today about this class. Um, we see lots of babies here, so I'm sure that it's uh, gonna be a great class tonight. Yes, and this right here will be our fifth class. Um, so wrapping up the series, so the parents will learn about newborn and parenting care. They'll also receive some, some gifts for their particip participation in the classes, and we hope that what we were able to share with them, they could go back and use when it's time for them to deliver. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Who let the owls out? We did. Let's go to Harris Lake County Park to learn more. So we're at Harris Lake County Park, uh, which is in the very southwest corner of Wake County. Um, and we just released some birds that were, two of them were found here. A third was just released here as a convenience. So I come to this park a lot and the staff know me and they know I like birds because I'm here taking pictures of birds all the time. And they told me that a, another person here found an owl on the ground one day in May and they told me where it was. So I came out to look to see if I could find the nest or the parents, but instead I actually found a second owl baby on the ground. And so I picked it up and carried it back to the car and uh, they referred me to a vet in Raleigh, which is where I took it. And then that vet transferred it to the, the rehabber in, who's specialized in raptors. So here in North Carolina, we have three, we mainly have three species of owls. There's the great horned owl, the barred owl and the screech owl. Um, the screech owl is the smallest of the three and probably the one that you're least likely to find. Uh, that doesn't mean they're rare, they're just very nocturnal. Yeah, the other two owls, the great horned and the barred, they, they will, they're nocturnal as well, but they will do some things during the day. Whereas the screech owl is more strictly nocturnal. So a lot of people bring in birds that don't actually need help, which is probably a big thing to know, uh, especially uh, in the breeding season when the fledgling birds are first leaving the nest, it's not that uncommon to find them on the ground. The parents are still coming around and feeding them. In this case, these owls were way too young to be out of the nest. They were only like a week old when they're, they should be in the nest for like a month. So they definitely needed help. And we, we couldn't locate the nest, so we didn't know where, we couldn't put them back, for example. Um, so it was def this was definitely a scenario where a rehabber was necessary. I don't know exactly why the owls were out of the nest to begin with. Um, they are relatively common here at this park, uh, but I think the birds need all the help that they can get. People should look at the birds and pay more attention to nature and wildlife. Good luck, little buddy. We're back. I'm here with Matt Roy Lance, Deputy Director of Community Services. Matt, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me. So Wake County Public Libraries operates 23 libraries across Wake County. We could talk all day about the resources and services that the libraries provide, but could you give a brief overview of the system? Yeah, I'd be happy to. Uh, one of the easiest ways that I can think of to describe it to people is, you know, there's several kinds of people that enjoy our libraries. Uh, first are just people that love reading which kind of makes sense. Books is our, our thing. It's, it's always been that way, and that's still a priority for us now. We also uh, like to, to cater to lifelong learners, you know, people that come to the library, whether it's uh, a, a child that's in school, maybe doing some homework or uh, working on a school project, to adults that are <clears throat> interested in learning more about a hobby or maybe brushing up on some skills for a job they're going after. And then it's also a place for people to connect with other people, um, you know, think of a, a parent bringing a child to a story time program and, you know, they, they love the program, but they also have a chance for the, maybe the kids to play with each other a little bit afterwards and the parents to connect a bit. And, you know, adults might come and enjoy a, a book club. So it's a, it's a way to bring people together. So that's, that's part of how I would describe it. Uh, you know, I, I guess I would also say it's a, it's a place for everybody. You know, we are, uh, we cater to people of all ages, all income levels, different uh, ethnic backgrounds or physical abilities. Um, there's something for you at the library, uh, whether that's the programs or the books, like I talked about earlier, uh, free public Wi-Fi. There's just 
there's something uh, to do, and our, our staff is super helpful. Uh, a couple stats that might be interesting to people. Last year, we had 11.8 million items checked out from our collection, and about 314,000 people attended our programs. So um, we're excited to see people when they come. Yes, absolutely. Those are great stats. Thanks for sharing those. Mm -hmm. So November. Yeah. Um, what are voters being asked to decide on this coming election? They're being asked to vote on a $142 million bond referendum that would pay for the uh, construction of new libraries, renovating existing libraries, and expanding libraries. And that'll be on the bond, or the ballot rather, on November 5th. What is being included on this $142 million bond? Yeah, there's a lot of projects. Uh, let me tell you about some of them. The, the first one that comes to mind is that we're gonna build a new community branch for the Rollsville community, which is the only municipality in Wake County that doesn't currently have a library. And it's a, as everybody knows, if they've been there recently, it's an incredibly fast growing area. And so we're excited to be able to serve the residents of that community. We are also building a new community branch in the uh, Friendship area of Apex, so the, the far southwestern corner of Wake County. And that's another rapidly growing area. We don't have a library in that part of the community, so we're excited to be able to add service there. We are also proposing to, <clears throat> to renovate or, or replace, rather, a uh, branch at the Athens Drive Library. That library is actually inside the high school, which has been a great partnership over the years, but they're going to renovate that high school. And when they're done with the renovation, there won't be room for the library to be at that in that same space. And so in order to keep providing service to that community, we've got to build a new Athens Drive library nearby. So that's proposed to be part of the bond. There's also uh, there's a, a community branch already in Wendell, but it's very small, by far the smallest of all of our branches, our community branches. And it's just not up to the even the current standard of what we would like, particularly for a community that's growing as fast as Wendell. So we're proposing to build a replacement branch that would be much larger and better suited for a growing community like Wendell. And we are also proposing a, uh, an expansion of the Fuquay Verena Community Library to make it a regional size, just to make it bigger because it's one of our busiest branches, our community branches. And then there's one other uh, item to talk about, which is, you know, the commissioners had an interest in uh, a, maybe a non-traditional library branch that could help serve some of the uh, digital equity needs in the community. And uh, they also had some interest in thinking about, you know, the, the Southeast uh, Raleigh community and whether there was a way to uh, put some library, additional library investment in that part of the community. And so they, um, they decided to put money in for a branch but uh, we're just calling it to be determined at the moment, uh, which is not the most <laughs> exciting name in the world, but it'll give us a little bit of time to finish a study that the county is doing on digital equity and the commissioners will you know, get a little bit more information about what the options might look like and then we can define that in more detail. But that's included as well. And then finally, we have eight locations that are due for a renovation. And that's usually just based on the, the age and wear and tear of our facilities. We wanna keep investing in them so that they look good and. We have uh, eight branches that are uh, 2016 or earlier. And 2016 kind of seems recent, but our libraries get a lot of traffic. And, you know, the bond is also something that will take us, you know, five, six, seven years to complete. And so those libraries that still look kind of new now, by the time you get to the end of the bond, they're going to, they get a lot of love and we need to, we need to give them a little attention. So uh, that's, that's it in a nutshell. Okay. And so from that list, how are these potential projects chosen? Yeah, there's a lot of factors that go into it. Um, one of the main ones that we look at is um, how can we serve the most people in the community? And right now we have uh, almost everybody within a 20 minute drive of libraries, but we would like to have everybody to have even more convenient access to a library. And so our goal is that everybody is within a 10 minute drive. Right now, we have about 84% of our population that's within 10 minutes. And when, by you know, choosing some additional branches, we hope to get that number higher. And so uh, we will look at maps of that drive time and see where there's some gaps in the, um, in the community and where it might make sense to, to put new branches. And that's how we came up with some of these projects. We also take a look at the stats of our, our library usage, you know, how many people are coming to certain branches and 
uh, the books that are checked out and the, um, the program attendance and the PC usage and things like that. So we kind of get a sense for how busy some of our locations are and which ones make, make sense to be expanded. And so that's part of the equation. And then we also look at the demographics of the nearby area. So, you know, when I was talking about that 10 minute drive time, we'll look at the, uh, the population within that. It's not, it's always not, it's not necessarily a circle exactly, but you know, we kind of think of it as a circle. So we'll look at the population in there and the demographic trends and the growth patterns and that kind of thing. And um, so that sometimes that will help us make a decision about where to invest in library resources. So there's really a lot of things that all come together and um, help us make those decisions. Why is the county putting a bond on the ballot now? Well, I think one of the biggest reasons is that uh, the last time we did it was in 2007, which is more than 15 years ago. And you know, we have a great library system, but in order for it to, to stay great, we have to keep investing in it. And it's been, there's been a lot of growth in the community since that 2007 bond. And there's areas of the community that don't currently have library service because they've, they've just really grown in that time. And we'd like to be able to provide service to those parts of the community. So uh, just keeping up with growth and you know, investing in our existing facilities is really important to us as well. So we want to make sure that we're doing that. And also, it's a, a strategic priority of the county, you know, uh, making sure that we have top-notch educational facilities for our residents and libraries are a part of that. So uh, we want to make sure that we're helping meet that goal. What will this mean for taxes? That's a good question. If the bond is approved, the tax rate would increase by a quarter of a cent. So to make that a little bit more relatable, if you're a homeowner and you have a house, uh, let's, for every $100,000 of home value, your taxes would go up by $2.50 a year. So in Wake County, the average home is worth $462,000. So if, if that's, you know, if, if you're in that category of, of that average homeowner, then uh, you would pay an extra $11.50 a year. Okay. And if approved, when would work start? It would start in fiscal year 2026. So, uh, you know, July 1, 20, 2025 is the first date of that fiscal year. And we would probably a lot of the work in the beginning would be, you know, design work and land acquisition. Um, so it wouldn't always be visible from day one, but the, the work will start then. Okay. And how can people learn more about the bond and the potential projects that are included? Well, one great way to do that is to go to the website. Uh, if you go to wake.gov slash Library Bond 24, um, that will have all sorts of information. And the other thing I would encourage people to do is go to the libraries. Uh, we'll have lots of information there and our staff will be ready to answer your questions. Awesome. Well, Matt, thank you so much for joining us today. Oh, you're welcome. Thanks for having me. Only one in five people recycles in their bathroom. So Wake County is making it easy to get started. If you sign up for our bathroom recycling initiative and agree to take a survey, we'll give you a free three gallon recycling bin for your bathroom while supplies last. For more information, visit the website on your screen. During the summer months, heat safety is very important. This includes your pets and your children. Let's go to Leah Holdren to tell us more about hot car safety. Welcome back. We are here again with Darlene Singletary. Darlene, thanks for joining us Thank for you. another important topic. We yes. are outside in the hot sun. What's going on? What are we doing? So today we're doing our hot car event. So we do this every year where we like to provide education and, and awareness to the community about the dangers of leaving a child in the car. And then also to show demonstration of how hot it can get in a car compared to the temperature that it may be outside. So we have this event where we have a s'more demonstration to show you that with the extreme heats that a car goes through with sitting outside, it actually can be to the point that you can cook s'mores on your dashboard. We also like to put up a digital thermometer that shows the differences in what the temperature in the car would be versus what it is outside. And then we just provide a lot of education, just making sure that caregivers and parents understand to avoid leaving a child in a car, a car at all costs, just because of the risk of heat strokes, because children get hotter three to five times faster than adults do. Um, 
But then also too to make sure that they understand to create reminders. Reminders being that, you know, put a baby bag, put a purse, put something in the back seat to help to remind that person that that child is still back there. And then also too, the final thing is just taking action so that if, you know, people are out in the community and they see that a child is left in the car, making sure to, you know, call 9 or, or get some help to get that child and have them to be removed from that car. And you mentioned calling 911. There's there, there's no crime in calling 911 if the child no. is safe. You should be it's better to be safe than sorry. Is it what is. You're it's very, it's very, very much safe to be sorry, um, and that's for the simple fact to where a person may think leaving a child in a car for ten minutes is safe. It's uh, not. A car can actually get nineteen to twenty degrees hotter within ten minutes of what the outside temperature is. Which, if you think of a ninety degree day or a hundred degree day, that's at an extreme heat that can lead to a heat stroke for a child. And you mentioned some tips, some tricks that people can um, use to remember if they have left their child in the back seat. What are some of those? Yeah, so there's a lot of different things that people can do to take precaution. One of the things is when we, when we start to think about technology, so has how things are starting to advance. So now we have it to where some of our newer model cars actually will give a, a person a reminder, which is a great thing. So if a person happens to open their back seat for whatever reason, whether that be putting their dog in, whether that be putting the child in, whenever that person goes to turn that car off, that car is gonna, sen gonna send out a notification and actually put off a, a, a dinging um, noise to let them know, hey, there's a child still in the back seat. Also too, we have car seats that have capabilities to where you can plug on the car seat to the car and the car will be able to know that that child is in that back seat and also do the same thing. It will give the person a notification to not forget that child. Great. And I know we talk about, unfortunately, there are deaths every year. What are some of those numbers that you see? So here in the United States, we've seen about 29 deaths. Um, and so far for 2024, we were at, at five deaths. Um, and one of the things that we like to do in remembrance of those children is we like to show some type of memorial. So we have Planet Pinwheels in representation of those 29 deaths that has occurred within last year. And we're hoping that with the number of five that it doesn't rise anymore, that people take precaution within these very hot summer months to never leave their child in the car. All right, well, thank you, Darlene. Uh, as we can see, it is much hotter in the car than it is out here, and it's hot out here. Hot out so here. this is very important information to get out. So thank you for being with us today. Thank you. Welcome back. I'm here with Karen in Environmental Services to learn more about her role in protecting residents from the negative effect of stormwater. Karen, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. How does Wake County collaborate with the development community to ensure sustainable development? Essentially, we regulate privately funded development projects um, and we ensure that the sediment erosion control plans that are submitted are implemented in the field. We work with contractors and developers to set the project, um, set it off right, and, and then implement it all the way through construction until it gets to the post-construction phase where uh, we have a team that also comes into play there. Why is erosion and sediment control important? Erosion and sediment control is important uh, because no, sediment is the number one pollutant in North Carolina. Uh, it, sediment is a pollutant in multiple ways. Sediment located on our sites, known as soil, is a commodity. It's a valuable resource that's useful, that grows things, uh, but once sediment leaves our construction sites, it's a byproduct. It's a byproduct in that sediment can displace water in our streams and water bodies, which, which make the water flow um, into the floodplain. So we have flooding that occurs, but sediment also has other pollutants that bind to it. Those other pollutants such as nitrogen or heavy metals are harmful to our water bodies. So the work that we do on a construction site, because we take a very vegetated area and we remove the ground cover from that vegetated area, that site has an opportunity to undergo accelerated erosion. And so as opposed to maybe a couple of tons per acre per year in which it would normally erode being bare, it would now be eroding at a rate that's more like a couple hundred tons of soil that could be generated from a site per year. What are the responsibilities of the contractor in maintaining compliance with Wake County's erosion control guidelines? So the responsibilities of the contractor are, are pretty heavy. Um, again, our ultimate goal is to retain soil to the site. 
He takes the approved plan uh, that comes through our plan review group and he implements it on the ground. The plan that he receives is a bare minimum plan. We expect our contractors and our development team to go above and beyond that plan in order to make that site work and in order to be able to retain sediment um, throughout the entire construction project. Um, so just like in, in agriculture with our soil and water conservation group, they have a farmer that they, they have practicing conservation on the land and they call them environmental stewards where our contractors representing our development team on our construction sites are our environmental stewards. Josh, we're here at Sandy Pine Preserve. Tell me a little bit about what you do. Well, my name is Josh Nelson and I work with Sanford Contractors. I'm a general superintendent. I've been with them 25 years. How do Wake County inspectors help you in the erosion and sediment control process? I think Wake County does a great job. I've worked for a lot of different counties, but Wake County does a good job. And, and I think at the initial, when they get the plans to, to approve the plan, it seems they always approve a well thought out plan. Um, and when I get it, uh, and I can always look at it and tell that it's been, it's been looked over and, and, and things have been thought through. What tips can you share for achieving field success in erosion control? There's a lot of things that you can do, but uh, you know, I always like to start with a good solid plan. Uh, if you don't have a plan when you start a site, you're going to set up for failure. Um, I always look to get ground cover started as soon as possible. Um, that, that's a big thing in erosion control and, and staying in compliance is getting ground cover. I like to have a plan thought out from the beginning to the end and uh, always take in consideration regulations. I don't try not to let my mass grading get ahead of my erosion control and my ground cover. Um, and I always try to think about what we could do better during that process. What resources are available on the Wake County website to assist with plan submittal and erosion control processes? There is information there that can help steer uh, the engineers who are submitting the plans, gives them some checklists, gives them some guidelines on, again, trying to accomplish our overall goal of retaining soil to the site. That plan review process is 30 days. Um, and at the end of that 30 day period, the plan will either be approved or disapproved. Uh, once that plan is approved, it moves on to the construction team, which is our team, and the resources on the website kind of steer you to being able to set up a pre-construction meeting. That's the first kind of real phase uh, where we see the construction side of things come into the picture, our contractors, um, and then our third party compliance folks. And we, through that pre-construction meeting process, we kind of lay out um, what the expectations are for the, um, for the overall construction development for the site. Uh, the other information on the website kind of steers at the end of construction, which is steered, geared more towards of our post-construction stormwater team. And, um, and the information that's there will help you through the as built process, submitting of those drawings, uh, and then going through the approval process to be able to complete the stormwater permit and then ultimately the land disturbance permit as well. Thanks, Karen. Thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you, Taylor. That's all for this episode of Wake TV. Keep up with all the latest Wake County news by visiting us online at wake.gov news. And be sure to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube so you can always stay in the loop. We'll see you next time.